Swap Colloquial Program for the semester and for the year, uh, sponsored by several organizations, include organizations including the Center for Art, Museum and Cultural Heritage Law, SIPLA, the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Information Technology, and also the student group Achilles, the Art and Cultural Heritage Law Society. And I'm very pleased at the turnout that we have here today because we also have a very special speaker, uh, Jane Levine, who's come to us not only from New York, but more importantly from Sotheby's, uh, which as you should all know is, um, I'll say it's the largest auction house in the world, or almost the, either the largest or the second largest. Um, I'm not going to get in the middle of that conversation. Uh, Ms. Levine is the worldwide director of compliance for Sotheby's. So she is basically their chief compliance officer responsible for ensuring that everybody does what's right and certainly at least does what's legal throughout the world. And when we say throughout the world, we really mean it. Uh, Sotheby's has offices all over the world, conducts auctions all over the world, and so there's a great deal of compliance that needs to be done. Ms. Levine received her undergraduate degree from Brown University and her JD from New York University School of Law. After several years in private practice, she became an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York and gradually developed an expertise in cases involving art crime, uh, art fraud, uh, as well as uh, and, uh, different aspects of art uh, crime, and also uh, civil forfeiture. Uh, involved with artworks and cultural property. Uh, while she was at the Southern District, she also became uh, the sort of coordinator or the main uh, U.S. attorney with AUSA dealing with the FBI art crime team, which was created specifically of uh, a few federal prosecutors along with quite a few federal agents who, uh, you know, FBI agents who in fact do investigate and eventually prosecute different kinds of art and cultural property crime. So I think with that, I will turn it over to find out what is a typical day in the life of Sotheby's Director of Compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joseph Lewis, for that introduction. And thank you for uh, all of you and for having me here. Um, Thank all of you for coming during the lunch hour, even though know, the free food is probably a people draw. I'm still really happy to see so many people. Um, so I, you know, began from the introduction, and I am a lawyer. Uh, I have uh, an interesting path to get to the position that I hold today, uh, which is as the worldwide director of compliance and Um Primarily, uh, my background is as a litigator. I have a litigation background in law firms and this attorney's office. Um, but about five years ago, I left, uh, I think left litigation to take this position as some of these money that we want to do. And um, it's, a very, it's a very big change for me. It's a very different job. Um, and I'm often asked, what is it that you do? What is compliance? Hopefully, I'll give you a little bit of a plate for what this is. Um, but I wanted to start, and I'm hoping I'm standing in the middle of that. I wanted to start uh, just giving you some background about what Sotheby's is before I get into what I do with it. Um, whether we're the largest, the oldest, uh, we are an auction house. Uh, began in 1744. Those numbers are uh, plastered up on the building in New York City, so we never forget that. Um, one of the most important things to know about some of these, at least for my, my talk today, is we're publicly traded. So in 1988, the company was taken public, we traded on the New York Stock Exchange, our symbol is bid. Um, and so we are subject to all the rules that any company, publicly traded corporation uh, has to abide by. So that should get you thinking of some of the things I need to worry about. Um, we have, you know, we're very global. We have 90 locations around the world in 40 different countries, um, uh, roughly 250 auctions 
each year um, in a lot of different categories of materials. It's a lot, it's a, it's a big book of business. A lot of legal jurisdictions are involved. And um, I just have down here our 2010 net sales number, which was, which was quite a, an incredible year for us. But uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of valuable assets that are involved, 4.8 billion last year. Um, yeah, so, so, Sotheby's business is um, uh, maybe well known to some of you, like an auctioneer's, but a lot of people are confused on this, so I just wanted to set out that our basic core business is auction. And what that means is people who own collectibles bring them to Sotheby's uh, on consignment and they engage others <coughs> to sell it through the auction process. So, Sotheby's is typically not the owner of the art. It's a common misperception. Sotheby's and Christie sell stuff. Well, we do sell it, but we're not. Remember, in most of the auction transactions, we're not the owner. Um, Sotheby's also engages in private uh, sale transactions. So that's a growing part of the business, particularly in the art world today. Um, and so we sometimes do function like art dealers. Um, in addition, there's a business that involves standing loans collateralized against artwork. So, for those of you who may have some experience with corporations or the banking world, we, we lend money. So there are some instances where we act a little bit like a bank. Although one of my colleagues refers to us as a very high class pawn shop. It's <laughs> <laughs> sort of a piece of our business. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, we sell every kind of thing imaginable. This is a list of the departments. Um, and one of the things that is really fascinating and one of the most wonderful things about the position I hold in compliance is that, you know, I deal with all of this all over the world. It's not just one department or one location. We're globally trying to you know, set the, the policy and the rules for the company. And um, it just never ceases to amaze me how, how many different, wants me to restart, how many different types of, of pro, uh, objects we deal with, cultures, time periods. It's really uh, breathtaking. Um, now, some of these was, we, we, we believe we were the first company to, uh, at least in the arts industry, to establish a worldwide compliance department. Um, I am uh, the department head. There are four full-time lawyers that, that in, my, in my group. Two of us are in New York, two of us are in London. Together, we have to monitor the whole world. We have some support staff. Um, but. Uh, the, the, the creation of the compliance department at some of these um, was the outgrowth of a little bit of scandal in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, there was an expose done of some of these back in the early 90s that revealed some iffy practices. And as an outgrowth of that, the company you know, had a complete review of its practices done, and the, and the aftermath was to create a compliance function. And today, the department has grown to uh, really one of the largest the company of our size. It's a pretty large group. Um, we have, together uh, with my colleagues, we are responsible for crafting and monitoring the company's code of conduct and the policies that govern our business practices. We train people. Um, on a continuous basis on what the policies are, uh, so they're aware of the rules and understand them. And we spend a lot of time troubleshooting. We want people <coughs> to feel that it's important for them to spot the issue and then come to us before they do something. But make sure it's being done the legal way, the ethical way. Um, if something goes wrong, we're there to investigate. So I'm continuing the law enforcement background. Um, uh, not, not always the happiest 
application like that is certainly a part of the compliance function to investigate breaches of, of, the, um, of the policies. So he tried to figure out how best to give you a sense of what I do rather than just sort of telling you about the types of issues that come under, under my umbrella. Um, I kind of thought, well, let me go through my email, my phone messages, and see what, what, is, what is the kind of stuff that I deal with every day. Um, it's pretty whack. Um, it's very hard to describe to people how crazy. Um, but I put together, and I'm going to tell you now that I've made up a lot of the emails here and changed the names to protect the uh, guilty. And uh, <laughs> the property images are not quite, but, but almost everything I'm going to show is based on a completely true interaction. Let me see if I can give you a sense of what it's like to be me. Um, so here could be a typical arrival in my office or on the bus and I'm reading my email. And this could come in from the 20th century design department. Simple question. Hi, Jane. An important client brought the attached uh, jar in. There's an image attached. It wants estimates and wants to know if we can put it in our next sale. What do you think? I get this on my card. You want me if you can take this, but then I can click on the picture and I would see something like this. Does anyone, can you see this? This is, and this is a true story, but this is not the image. This is a tobacco jar made of an elephant foot. Um, and the question is, that would come to me, is can we sell this? <laughs> Putting aside whether we want to sell this. Um, this was actually a practice in, who knew, in the Victorian period when people were killing the human elephants. They, they took the feet and made, made jars out of them. And there's a thing going on. Um, and this actually came in, this, this exact uh, issue came in the first day of work of uh, a colleague uh, of, um, who, uh, who had just you know, joined the compliance department. the first question she had to answer. And I'm really glad she stayed with us. But what, <laughs> what are the, ser the serious issues that this actually taps into? Uh, <coughs> serious legal issues, which um, might not, uh, you might not see first, but we have a lot, there's a lot of property that's actually made with different uh, um, endangered species material. Ivory, tortoise shell, um, bird feathers, all <coughs> things um, are very heavily regulated. The Endangered Species Act, um, some of you may be familiar with, the Migratory Bird Act makes it illegal to commercially sell or transport over <coughs> state or international borders material you know, that's, that's not within, that's not legal. Um, some of you may be familiar with the CITES the Convention, International Trade of Endangered Species. Um, there's been a lot in the news lately about the Gibson guitars, the rays, uh, so some of you are shaking your head. Um, that's um, an endangered species issue. It's actually a uh, type of uh, the wood. So it's um, an animal with sort of form. Um, but to violate those laws and sell something that you can't sell is actually a serious federal felony under the Lacey Act. And um, uh, it is amazing to me how many of these issues we have. Um, we have to get people to identify the material, determine how old it is, and we can figure out if we're even allowed to handle it. Um, uh, I think we ended up not selling the elephant from jar, just in case you're ignorant. Um, just you know, give you another example. This is a picture of the Hawaiian oo bird, which um, we uh, were given this beautiful cape, a Hawaiian cape, which was also something made uh, typically for Hawaiian nobility in the 19th century. It's a beautiful thing, but uh, specialists in charge of the department knew about bird feathers, and we checked, and this oo bird was not on my short bird list. So it was cool for sale. Um, uh, we took it for consignment. We sent it out of the country for an exhibition. And they amended the law for the first time since 1917. And the Oka bird became on the list. And we had to face this question. Now what do we do? Because we can't move this thing back into the United States. It's now become illegal. 
you know, very challenging to come up with resolutions. Um, we did find a really great solution for this one. Uh, ended up working very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Federal Agents to convince them um, that since it wasn't on U.S. soil, it was out of their jurisdiction, and it's actually in a museum now. Um, so just to give you another flavor, if any of you saw this article in the New York Times, there is a, uh, an epidemic of uh, theft of rhinoceros food. It's, it's believed that if you grind it up, um, it's, it has medicinal properties. And all over the world, we're seeing museums being raided uh, for the horns. It's a kid looking for a horn in a museum. But for us, it has an impact because it's not a great picture, but there is um, uh, you know, a huge market in these uh, libation groups that are, that were made in the 17th, 16th century in China out uh, of rhinoceros. And people are actually buying them to grind them up. Um, that's how much the, the rhinoceros horn is going on, on the black market, that it could be worthwhile to bid on an ancient object, not to have it, but to grind it up. Or we're seeing people uh, make fake ones, take recent rhino horn um, and, 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 and for them. Anyway, um, this is um, one of many areas that we deal with. Um, we have questions that are, you know, come up with human remains. <coughs> Should we, could we sell a mummy? I actually had uh, one of my funniest emails I got just last week from one of my colleagues. So it became some great news. The mummy is not a mummy. You know, because we have to have <laughs> offer the mummy for sale and we torture ourselves with it. What are the ethics? Putting aside if it's legal, selling human remains, which we generally. So that's my, endang my endangered species um, headache uh, happens all So I could be um, <coughs> finished dealing with the elephant quick jar. Um, and then this could come in, hypothetically, from the jewelry department. <coughs> Jane, the attached picture is a blue diamond being sold by a company <coughs> called ABC. Uh, Sam Smith is the person we're dealing with, and he says he can't give us any more information uh, about ABC or the owners of this diamond. Uh, he's going to go bold to our competitor, uh, unless I can get him a good over the next two hours. You know, can you help me out? <coughs> what, what, are, what are the issues here? This is not the diamond, this is another thing that we know. You know, what are the issues here? Why are why is you know, Gary Schuler and Julie coming to see me? This is tapping into another major area of anti-money laundering um, and our obligation to know our clients. Um, we get offered a lot of very high value value property, and under the laws of many jurisdictions, almost every jurisdiction where we operate, we have some obligation to, to know who our clients are, to understand the source of <coughs> of wealth or, uh, or the asset that they're selling us. And um, as you can imagine, we get a lot of property that's being handled by offshore companies or companies that are where the ownership, the true beneficial ownership is intentionally buried very deep. After all, that's the whole purpose of offshore <coughs> companies. And, and um, uh, and we, have, we face a very challenging uh, situation where we have to um, basically identify our client and get to a point where we're comfortable with the transaction. Um, just to give you uh, a, a little bit more flavor, you know, we, we do um, have an obligation to identify the consigner. So the consigner is our client acting as an agent on behalf of that person. We have to know who it is. We have to get a minimum uh, of non-identification documents. Um, when it's an entity, it can be more challenging. Um, you know, as in this example, who are the beneficial owners? That's uh, something that for most transactions, we may not be legally obligated to drill down to, but for some, we are. Um, very challenging. Other 
super relevant issues, and this actually happens in jewelry as a collecting area. What is the person that we're dealing with as a felony conviction? Um, what if it's not a conviction, it's just a newspaper report that they are under investigation, reporting? Um, what if there's no mention of a, of a law enforcement action, it's just a lot of negative media reports? Um, we, uh, we have co the commercial imperatives on the one side and one itself, we sell property as much as we can, um, but we're also obligated to protect staff and make sure the company is not getting itself involved in something that it shouldn't be. Um, these are very, very difficult judgment calls that we have to make. Um, we you know, train people on looking at bed plans, suspicious behavior, strange payments. We are moving a lot of money um, really all over the world. Buyers are coming from one continent, uh, one money moved to another, and um, people asking us to do funky things with payment is a red flag and the call to weigh in on a lot of very strange requests. Another thing that you may know something about is you know, is, the, is the person a politically exposed person? They call pets. So uh, the, that question arises out of anti-corruption and anti-bribery rules. We are all, at least those of us who follow criminal law, like I do, about the F FCPA prosecutions. That's uh, you know, the Federal Court Practices Act. Um, it is you know, illegal to facilitate, you know, to, to launder funds that are derived from bribes. And um, we have had people come to us to offer property that will have very modest sounding government job titles. And they may be the Minister of Agriculture in a very tiny nation somewhere that's very known for its corruption. And the question is, how much does this person own $50 million worth of artwork? Is this, is, this, is this corruption? So, and who are you? We have a lot of questions around that. So anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, very big part of what I deal with. Um, the anti-corruption laws, uh, the UK just enacted the Bribery <coughs> Act. So I may have you who have an international perspective there. I'm reading a lot about that. Every jurisdiction has a law. Um, and a uh, big part of what we do. <clears throat> okay, so once I finish clearing Gary Schuler's money laundering jewelry dealer, um, uh, here's another one. While you were talking to Gary about the diamond, the press, Diana in press called and said she wants to speak with you immediately about a blog that James Mike is actually in. Uh, an expert of ours in 20th century design um, that James Midas has just <laughs> So you might be thinking, why are they coming to you about a blog? Um, but this is actually one of the hottest issues in compliance these days. Uh, kind of under the head of social media. Uh, you know, looking around this room, I know all of you know what Facebook is and Twitter. Not so much for some of the old ones and some of these, but this is a very huge, big issue um, in compliance today. Uh, companies are embracing the use of things like blogs, Facebook, Twitter, and social media um, as a marketing tool, as a way to communicate with potential clients, actual clients. Um, but there's also difficulty in to balance out how you control and keep tabs in regulate what people are saying and doing on Facebook. It's their own personal Facebook, what they could be, you know, putting a lot of stuff out on the internet that is about the company or about company clients, confidential information. Um, and then you have to balance all of that with the um, other side of the coin, which was just reported, I think, a few days ago, uh, in the paper that um, the NLRB has just issued a report to that, you know, at the same time, the employer has to be careful not to infringe on the Section 7 rights of workers to communicate with each other about their work conditions. So on the one hand, uh, be very careful not to unreasonably restrict what employees can do on their own Facebook account. 
consider protected activity. On the other side, you have to protect the company from crazy, wild and crazy guys like James who might, you know, s s say colorful things on the blog. Um, and on the other hand, um, obviously, you know, Facebook. I mean, we have a Facebook page. Uh, we we are out there on a tip. Of course, this is all officially controlled by our press department, and we're even on Twitter. So um, we, we, last year, we, uh, you know, in compliance, did a whole review of what other companies are doing, and we crafted a policy for some of these, um, drafted a lot of trade on. So, um, so that's another. Another thing that could possibly come up at any moment um, during my day uh, is to move on. Okay. So um, here's another typical, in fact, this email I made it up and I literally finished typing it and then checked my real email and got <laughs> this exact question. <laughs> um, really scary, but uh, if the question is so-and-so, and so, pick Sally Doe, uh, call to register to bid in, for a few blocks in her mother's estate sale that's happening, you know, for next week. And the fashion of this is coming from the bids department, where they take a uh, bid registration, asking me, you know, can you remind me, what am I supposed to do on this issue? Um, and this kind of goes to the more general subject area that comes within compliance, the uh, auction process. Uh, can, can a beneficiary of an estate bid in the estate sale? I sort of have an interest in the sale, so you might think that's not such a cool thing to do, um, unless, of course, it was made very clear that that was happening. In fact, that is the rule that um, a beneficiary of you know, any interested party uh, wants to be in the auction rooms, it must be you know, designated in the catalog that there will be an interested party bidding on the lot, and if it's not in the catalog, it's going to be announced right before that lot comes up for sale. Um, but um, many times we get questions about on the fringes of that, what's okay. Not, the questions are not always that clear cut. Um, we are very, we have a lot of rules about what can happen in the auction room, in the bid process, that are designed to make sure that there is a level playing field for all the people in, in, in the bids, that it is fair and transparent. And um, most of these issues that come in can be cured with disclosure. But as with many issues, uh, you, you, they, they're, they're, the disclosure cure often works best when you tell the person who's asking you, well, you can do that, but you need to tell everyone you're doing that, becomes a lot less attractive. It's like, well, I don't want to tell people that. And then it's sort of, I you able to look at them and say, well, then doesn't that tell you maybe it's not something you want to do? So we spend a lot of time talking, talking people out of doing things when we just point out to them what you expose it. Um, but we get, you know, this is, this is uh, an area where people, we'd like people coming to compliance. A couple of other similar issues that will come across my desk. Um, can a consigner, we have cons consigners can be uh, collectors, regular people, or, or maybe not so regular, but individuals, or they can be dealers. We get you know, commercial consignments. So if an art uh, or, or a dealer in the field uh, consigns work, maybe maybe it's being consigned on behalf of that, that dealer's client, and then they have other clients who they who want to bid. But we have a problem because the consigner is the dealer, and then if the dealer is also bidding, it becomes the consigner bidding on his own property. Um, but not really because it's not he's not bidding for his own account. Well, we want to make we like to make that happen, right? We like to facilitate the commercial transaction, but we want to make sure it's above board. Um, so, you know, we have developed rules and forms. We get representations from people uh, that they're not big for their own account, and um, uh, sort of look for solutions to try to make things happen, but in a fair way. Um, And, and just, you know, uh, 
this is an image which I know you can't read, but I, I actually uh, was just talking earlier.
don't really want to present their very extremely valuable personal property to the government authorities to let them know that they're selling it. Um, there can be many reasons why there's an aversion to doing that. Um, so we run into a lot of friction, uh, sometimes with clients or even our own staff people who you know, bristle at the need to you know, get these licenses. But um, the consequences can be very bad. Seizures, claims, there's um, you know, any day you can pick up a newspaper and find a country and make it record. So, um, so that's a, not a movement of works of art, huge area for us. Um, let's see, I'm now uh, up to yeah, the afternoon. And uh, again, this is also a true story, although not the actual letter. So some Josh in the marketing department. <laughs> Uh, you know, sending me something saying, you know, you know, you need to deal with this, I'll catch you later. And I open the attachment and I can't read it, but this is a letter from a third party vendor that uh, we sub is engaged and it has, who has our client list. Um, and it's a very friendly letter saying, we were hacked. Um, sorry. Um, and this actually did happen, uh, but it brings up another completely new area that takes up a lot of my time, which is called data protection and information security. So any company, uh, and I'm sure all you can function without reading about this issue, today, um, you know, the, the problems that are involved with protecting proprietary information um, from reach, particularly online, you know, from unwarranted intrusions. Um, we have to work with the, work with the uh, IT group to come up with appropriate protections um, to guard ourselves against hacking. Have to be careful. People are trained how to protect the information that we have. Um, one of the other issues that's related to this is what kind of information is it acceptable and legal to collect about people? You can imagine the people I work with want to collect a lot of information about potential clients. They like to know a lot, they like to record a lot. But particularly out in Europe, where there are very strict rules governing data, data protection, you're not allowed to kind of just like write down in your file someone's you know, personally sensitive information. It's actually illegal. Um, you know, we might be very interested to know that someone is 95 and in bad health. Um, <laughs> might be, you know, needing to sell things soon. And it actually might be relevant to our business, and we might have a legitimate commercial need to know that. But um, we have to train our client development people to be, you know, very professional and careful about what information they're, they're reporting. Um, because this could violate the laws in you know, places we do business. Um, another really hot legal issue is and more related to the cyber attack that really happened is if we are, if there is a breach and information that you know, about our clients gets out, what are our legal legal obligations to notify breach notification? Um, what do we have to do in response to that? Um, all of these are sort of compliance issues that I have to deal with. Every state has its own law, every nation. It's not one uniform, easy to follow rule. So it becomes very complex. It's what I like to call outside counsel, or him. Um, this other, other issue, which is looms on my desk a lot, um, which is fascinating, is this sort of behavioral marketing. I don't have any of you reading about you know, the websites um, that will you know, collect information about you and then target their marketing team based on what you click around. Really great from the perspective of somebody who's into marketing, really not so great from the uh, agencies that are out there really and, and implementing privacy rules. So again, I think it was 
yesterday, and there's an article in the Times about the, uh, the European Union's uh, working group on data protection is considering going to what they call an opt-in uh, procedure for marketing. So it's not just enough to say, you're on the website, and if you don't like what we're doing, you opt out. They now want to have an affirmative, you need to opt in and affirmative and say, yes, I would like you to collect all this information about me and follow all my clicks to all the shoe stores, whatever it is. You know, I want you to do that. Um, so uh, this is another really interesting area of the law that affects our business. Um, and it's a lot of fun doing battle with the marketing department on that because, you know, that's, they, they never met a marketing technique they didn't want to try. 